I will not read the sermon text because we've already read it as our second lesson for today. So I would ask you that you'd keep page, your bulletin open to page 9 so you can follow along with verses 9 through 12. The neighborhood I grew up in had lots of kids. During the summertime, and again, because of my age, this is when you played outside. You finished breakfast and you were outside until the street lights came on at night. And baseball was our big thing. In fact, we would watch the Milwaukee Braves before they came to Atlanta. My father had been a great baseball player, and when I was five years old, he bought me a baseball glove, an adult glove. And then he took me outside to teach me how to catch, and he said, the most important thing to keep in mind is keep your eye on the ball. And so I stood there. My dad wound up, he threw, and I kept both eyes on the ball until it hit me in the nose and broke it. He had failed to tell me to raise the glove. When it came to batting, he had the same advice. Keep your eye on the ball. And that's what I would do, right into the catcher's mitt. Everyone in the neighborhood knew that. And we would choose up sides. It was the two biggest kids, and they would start picking the other kids. And I'd get so excited that I'd be picked. And they picked all the kids. In fact, they even picked all the girls. And then the two captains argued over who would get stuck with me. That is why I love 1 Peter chapter 1. Because in that chapter, Peter tells us how God has chosen us from all eternity And in chapter 2, he says, Now this is what I have chosen you to be and to do. Let's look at the first half of verse 9 of our text. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. God has not chosen us like those team captains when I was a young kid. No. See, God didn't choose us on the basis of something that we would do or could do or based on our potential. God didn't look down this long tube of history and say, you know that Eddie Shoopy guy? Can't play ball. Maybe he could be a preacher. That's not how God did it was totally and solely by his grace alone he chose us. Even before he created the world. Isn't that why you're here today? Whether in person or online, listening to God's word? From all eternity, God has so guided and directed the affairs of this world, and the affairs of our individual lives so that you would be here today, whether in person or online. For some of us, it may have been when we were an infant and our parents or our godparents carried us down to be baptized, as we've seen this month already. Or maybe it was later in life. But God the Holy Spirit worked through word and sacrament to bring each of us to a personal saving faith in Jesus Christ. And then Peter goes on to list the benefits of our calling and the privileges that we have. He goes on to say we are a royal priesthood. Now this had special meaning for Peter's first readers, especially those with a Jewish background. He 
because they learned that everything that the Old Testament had promised, had predicted, had said would happen, was accomplished in Jesus Christ, our great high priest. And notice what kind of priesthood it is. It is a royal priesthood. You and I are sons and daughters of the maker of heaven and earth. You and I are brothers and sisters of King Jesus. Peter continues, you are a holy nation. To fully grasp what he means there, we, we need to look at the understanding of holy in the original Greek. The original meaning of it is there's a large group of people and out of that large group of people, God selects a smaller group. He sets them aside, and the Greek word always includes a purpose, that he set them aside with a purpose. You're going to hear about that purpose later, so don't leave yet. We're just getting started. And then he has this awesome phrase. We are a people belonging to God. Now, in order to belong to somebody as a personal possession, something has to happen beforehand. Listen to how Peter describes that from chapter 1. He tells us that Christ paid the ransom price for our souls once for all. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. God, our Heavenly Father, then demonstrated the price that Christ paid for us on the cross, God the Father demonstrated that he had accepted that payment in full by raising his son from the dead. The Apostle Paul assures us of that in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. But he, that is Christ, was delivered unto death for our sins, but was raised again for our justification. Now let's look at the second half of verse 9. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. This is that purpose for which God set us apart. And many people are looking for purpose in life right now. A lot of people have been re-examining their life due to COVID-19. The racial tensions that we are feeling right here in our own area. And then all that political unrest, which is only going to increase up to November. We have the greatest purpose in the world. God has chosen each one of us to be his instrument to bring people into contact with his word so that the Holy Spirit can bring them to saving faith. Look at verse 10. That's where we see the true motive for all of this. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You and I know what we are by nature. In fact, turn back to page 3. Let's look at the confession of sins. Notice what we confess there. By nature, sinful. 
disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions, have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. And what do we deserve? What's the ultimate consequence for any and all sins? Punishment both now and in eternity. You see, spiritually we were nobodies. But God has made us into somebodies, and all for the sake of furthering his kingdom. And that really is our mission and our ministry, both personally and corporately. We are not to be just disciples. No offense, Pastor, but we, he wants us to be more than just disciples because we've been studying this month that in the God-lived life we are what? Students of the word, aren't we? But he also wants us as students of the word to become disciplers. God's plan of bringing saving faith to everyone is to use his chosen people, his royal priesthood, his holy nation, his people belonging to God to bring others to him. And as we bring people into contact with his word or the sacraments or simply inviting them to come and hear, that's how God works out the individual salvation for everyone. That's how he worked out our individual salvation. And now we want to share that with others. And God has given us so much media to do that. For most of us, pre-COVID-19, it was done in person, wasn't it? But then the game changed, and the tools changed. We could use our smartphone. We could use email. We could use Facebook. We could do Instagram, Snapchat. YouTube and even Zoom. What is more, there are no bounds for our mission or for our ministry. Peter talks about that in verse 11 to 12. Again, page 9. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. God wants us to prepare people to meet him now rather than for the first time on Judgment Day. My Uncle Paul said the second greatest gift God gave him next to saving faith was pancreatic cancer. Sounds strange for a gift, doesn't it? My Uncle Paul was my godfather. He and my Aunt Frida carried me forward to be baptized as an infant. He grew up in a strong Christian family, went to church every single Sunday. But then his church attendance started to uh, tail off from every Sunday to every other Sunday, then to once a month, then to once every three or four months, then Christmas and Easter, and then not at all. My Uncle Paul said this about that part of his life. If God would have taken me suddenly in a car accident, I would have gone to hell. You see, my Uncle Paul didn't just fall away from the church, did he? 
he fell away from God. But he'd immediately go on to tell people, but when my doctor told me that in six months I would meet my maker, I decided to reintroduce myself. And that's exactly what happened. He was reintroduced to his maker, and instead of having just six months, God gave him 18 months. And when he wasn't in the hospital, he was in church every Sunday. On his last night here on earth, he asked everybody to leave his hospital room, except for his minister. He asked his minister to help him out of bed. And he started to kneel. Minister helped him. He kneeled. And he and his pastor started to say the Lord's Prayer. And during the Lord's Prayer, his maker took him home to heaven. What a way to go. I want you to do something right now, and it's, it's a dangerous thing to do during a sermon, and hopefully no one started without us. I want you to close your eyes. Because I want you to generate a mental image for yourself. You are seated right behind home plate at Truist Field for an Atlanta Braves game. I know with COVID-19, you can't even imagine that anymore. Maybe you can imagine the paper cutouts, but the stadium is full, 40,000 people. From your vantage point, I now want you to cut that field in half. 20,000 of those people are going to hell because they don't know and they don't believe in Jesus Christ. Please open your eyes. Let me ask you this question. How many of those 40,000 does God want in heaven? All of them. And here's the big question. We've had it in the both hymns that we've sung today already. Whom does he want to use to bring those people to Jesus Christ? You and me. To equip us to do that, God has set up the office of the public ministry. I want you to listen to some words from Ephesians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul tells us what the office of the public ministry really is. It was he, that is Jesus Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers with this purpose, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. And here are six very big words. As each part does its work. Not some, not many, each and every. That's why Pastor Scharf is here, That's why Vicar Cox is here. Sometimes we feel that their role is to go out and do the work for us. But that's not God's plan. They are to go out with us to teach us, to encourage us, to show us how it can be done.
And that's the work they do with our present members. But they're also supposed to teach and raise up future leaders in our church, the young people among us, for the next generation. And this begins in our homes, in our neighborhoods, even in our schools. It could actually happen even virtual education and our workplaces. And we also reach out into all the world through our prayers and through our offerings to the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. In fact, many of you got to see how that is done by watching Taste and See this summer. And in all of this, we encourage each other in love. As the writer to the Hebrews said, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together. And here he's not talking about just in person, any type of meeting we have. And in the 21st century, a lot of meetings are done how? Online. As some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another. Get this. And all the more as you see the day approaching. The day. Judgment Day. You know, there is great joy in this mission and in this ministry. And over the years, you, have he you here at Abiding Grace have been able to witness that joy and have that joy. I don't know if you noticed, but if you go to docsabidinggrace.com, there are two entries there about the history of Abiding Grace. I read them yesterday. It was neat to go down that list. See how God constantly kept bringing more and more people in. And he's still doing it, isn't he? Yeah. We brought in new members this month, didn't we? We've seen the baptism of infants, young children, and sometimes we've even seen teens and adults, haven't we? Baptized. We've seen teens and adults come forward and confess their faith in front of the congregation, become adult communicant members, and then come forward to receive in, with, and under that bread and wine, Christ's true body and blood. Wow. This is a great place to be. Great congregation to be part of. In a devotional booklet that I have, it has a prayer for missionaries. These are the last two lines of that prayer. As we exit from church each week, or we turn off the online program, remind us that we are entering our personal mission fields. Prepare us so that we are always ready to share our faith. We know God has chosen us, not just our two called workers, but each one of us here today, whether in person or online, to be his ministers. He has given us a mission and a ministry. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people. Now you are the people of God. Please go forth as God's people. Amen.